Welcome to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. In series three, we'll be talking about healthcare from a global perspective, offering deep discussions about what it will take for a system shift that will benefit patients and healthcare professionals when medicine is practiced from the heart. We'll be hearing from Stephanie Mo Davis, Drs. Ruby Shah, Dan Dinenberg, and Diane Bonhoeffer as they share insights and wisdom from their personal experiences. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, everyone. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Ruby. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, so, uh, it's Stephanie here, Ruby. <laughs> so excited. This is our 10th episode. <laughs> this is, oh my God, we've come a long way. <laughs> so today we actually want to look at what does all of this mean? What is the, what is the system change we would like to see? And let's just review briefly. We started with why are we in this? as healthcare professionals and patients, what gets us there? We looked at suffering, what is it? And we explored this more deeply. Then we looked at the permission to be compassionate with ourselves and what does it mean to be compassionate with somebody else? What's the difference to empathy? We then looked at meaning and potential. We looked at resonance. What is resonance? Is this one of the key phenomena, one of the key principles? And we looked then at self-awareness. And from that, we went to sovereignty and established what do we mean by sovereignty in our context here? And then from that naturally evolved that what is it to actually see the patient before their disease? So that's where we get into truly promoting health and looking at potential rather than mistake or missingness or dis-ease. And today we want to ask now what? <laughs> so we recognize that there are there's a discrepancy between what we feel is valuable and what we observe when we go to work <laughs> or when we experience healthcare. And so when we ask the question today of system change, then again, we have this dichotomy where we can look at system as a composite of things, a set of things that together are parts of a larger unit of, of a mechanism. That's a very mechanical kind of objectified view of system. And there's another way to look at system, which is more like a set of principles and procedures, looking at an environment that is subject to change, to growth, an alive environment, something that, that continuously evolves. And I wonder if we could kind of find this as a as a cruising altitude of our conversation today. It's like, what are the principles and processes and requirements that we would like to see as a more evolved healthcare system as we see it today? So maybe we can just kind of start with, if you agree, we can just start with voicing ideas without necessarily kind of elaborating on them too much. But just let's let's see, can we come up with an immediate collection of principles that we would like to see manifested, that we would like to see given more attention to, so that we're all arriving in a place that seems more evolved from today. So we started with Stephanie in our first episode. So I think we should start with Stephanie in our last episode. So let's give the patients the voice first. <laughs> right. Obviously, and the easy thing would be to say that I would love to be a part of a healthcare system where mm. I was getting my needs met. I was had access to the resources that I need without having to have someone fight for my right to get what I need. Meanwhile, they're not getting what they need. And I'd also like to see my practitioners and providers not feel like victims to the system so they can show up as fully as they need to be in their calling because I need that in order for me to heal. I think coming from a, a broader spiritual perspective, I'd like to say that realizing that we, we are made up of this system, the system is comprised of us. And whether or not the system is a term that needs to become obsolete, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But within this system, we've complied and have all accepted for far too long the ways in which we feel victimized or have had to do things like become a perpetrator or a savior to try to feel balanced amongst our own healthcare calling or life. And I think one thing I'd like to say is these concepts that we've brought up in every episode, as we talked about earlier, seem to be very thematic of what's happening in many systems and even amongst people individually. For me, from this, the, this lens of the spiritual would be 
to broaden our perception to change means that we need to be willing to take the steps necessary to change. And to get broader within our psyche, we have to remove some things that feel that may be congesting our vision. So I would love to see the concept of Jungian shadow work normalized and formatted for not only patients who are interested in evolving their own way of seeing things as, as a means to see their blind spots, maybe to help them with their process of health better. But also, I would like to see this aspect of shadow work be promoted for every single practitioner and physician or healthcare provider within the system, because then at least we know that the ego isn't taking over and that we're coming and we're operating from this place of being committed to the best version of ourselves possible every day and the learning never stops. So there's a humility within the system that I think is so desperately lacking that I would love to see be reintroduced into the system. Mm, lovely. Wow. That's already, <laughs> I'm like, I couldn't write fast enough. <laughs> so thank you. Really important points. Great. Would you... Ruby, would you like to build on it? Um, yeah, I'm going to catch on the last powerful word that really resonates with me, which is humility. Um, and for me, that is, is, um, is connected to another word that probably doesn't connect for other people. But for me, humility is about permeability. <laughs> mm. And this is that you recognize that you are not a rigid wall, a cell wall made of dead things. You are living, you have receptors, you can sense, you can understand, you can take in, you can take out. But in the end, you are your own thing. You are your own cellular structure. Um, so that means you can still be strong and have your selfness without losing yourself. And um, so as I was listening to Stephanie and um, I felt that sense of the importance of understanding and, and changing our concepts around things like humility and permeability. A lot of clinicians, non-clinicians, the entire system thinks it's being very humble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, done nothing but bend over backwards for the patient, right? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we done that? Come on, yep. you guys. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. <laughs> but here we have the proof in the pudding, which is um, it's not working. It's it's uh -huh. it's not landing, and we're coming off as stiff, arrogant, stuck in the past, mm -hmm. and that's not us. That's not us. No, <laughs> we're much more permeable than that. <laughs> mm. Wow. <laughs> Powerful words. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that resonates deeply. <laughs> Jen, how about you? Let's just let, I don't want to be like, you know, let's just play, let's just throw spaghetti at the wall, okay? <laughs> to me, there's other words that come through. There's integrity. Mm. I think about the entire system and just, you know, what really drives me is I think of food as medicine. And so I think about what we're eating when we're working in a hospital setting or what we're serving to our patients and the waste, the absolute gross waste that occurs in these systems of how we handle this and how we take care of things. I mean, it's just like, there's these moments that I've seen where you're just like, it's just beyond belief of how this is set up and so just coming back to that integrity integrity of resources integrity of what we say and what we do and to be a part of that i think last episode i spoke to like what i would desire in the system is that love and connection and time and the ability to have that since this is spaghetti at the wall i think about you know creativity and innovation I think about that's the way that when you say permeability, to me, it's funny. I think about, uh, I think I'm an ecosystem biologist at my heart where I see these, these parts of the system together. And so, and I think about a resilient organism. It's one that can handle the outward expression of the environment around. And so the permeability in our world is creativity, is innovation. It's really looking at the precision 
medicine of dealing with the person in front of you and then what that dynamic is. And so it's not algorithmic in that way. I think of respect and care. And I think as we're creating a system, it's like we respect one another and we respect life itself and we respect the sanctity of spiritual belief and respect ourselves. Then this idea of union shadow work or the expression of really doing that to come to the place where you're helping others brings it all, brings it all through because you are respecting your, uh, yourself, you're respecting others, and now you're doing that all in service too. And when you create a new system that embodies these aspects that we're talking about, in the same way that we exist right now, I think all of us intuitively know that there needs to change. And I think this is a conversation we're obviously having, but I think at the basis of this is it's like, you know, the, the conversation behind is, is this system that we have, is it malleable? Is it changeable from the inside or does it need an f- entire new way of expressing that? And I think I'll just leave it there because this is food for thought. There's more kind of spaghetti. Jan, I'm really interested in sort of what you add to it. We have some really cool words coming in. What else is a part of this system? And and maybe even speaking to the idea of, is it possible to change this system the way we have it? Or is it a new system? I feel this is where Stephanie's question comes in. It's like, is system actually helpful? Is the term system here actually helpful? And one thing that we note is that what we call the healthcare system at the moment uh, is easily called that way because it has the rigidity of a system that is more like a technical, mechanical kind of system, right? Where everybody is in a cog in the system. And that's where that's actually what we're realizing is just not a suitable model for a biological system <laughs> that is not technical, right? For an organic entity, right? Um, And what we haven't really learned is to deal with an organic entity. And science prides itself of being totally ahead and on top of describing that organic entity because it's split it in so many parts we can't believe it. Um, It's hard to count them. And yet we're realizing that, that there is more to it than anatomy and physiology. And we're realizing that our world in way in which we have dared to describe it, right, um, is not sufficient any longer. And that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with it. It's, I mean, look at the advances, look at the gains, look at the insights. Incredible what happened in a few thousand years. And just take the last two or three hundred of really intensive progress in medicine. This is very young and it's phenomenal, right? Yet it's all with this science hat on. And it's the kind of science that allows in, it's, it's working on a basic assumption, <laughs> this kind of science, right? It's, it's following a particular method and does it very rigorously and it has all the advantages of doing so. And yet this is what influences the training of not only another generation of scientists, but also a generation of healers. And it kind of prepares very well for future science and possibly for, you know, having great ideas and coming up with patents and selling good things and making tons of money and building industries and the whole kind of money-making world. And that may be helpful. The results of that may be helpful for the healing encounter, but it's only a fraction of what actually happens in healing. And the rest of it, we haven't even dared looking at properly yet. I I would like as a system change, so to speak, I would like us to approach the next evolution, if you like, the next evolutionary step um, in healthcare to approach it with the humbleness and with the truly scientific mind, Ruby, that you're proposing is can we accept that we're really just scratching the surface? And could we see what might be the principles that are that that we would wish to govern future development? And and one of them to me is is love. One of them to me is that love is the fundamental principle that we haven't looked at yet 
you know, when you talk about somebody, when you when you use the word love, people think about romantic love, they think about sex, they think about all sorts of things, right? But it's not that kind of love that I'm talking about. It's 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 a field that we can drop into, or it's it's a it's an it's a force that is available that we can open up ourselves. And in my personal experience, it is it is something that is available if I'm not in the way. So this is where the continuous learning comes in for me that Stephanie was pointing out, right? Unless we actually see that we have shadow parts, as you coined it, or that there are that we are kind of in the way of trusting into something bigger than ourselves, and to trust and or to to be open for the possibility even that love is not relational and love is not transactional, but love is actually available even without Homo sapiens. That's a possibility too, right? So this is something that we're that that we're exploring right now in a in a next book with with our Juno Arda, um, where we're trying to see can we get there. So these are fundamental principles that I would like to be, be more clear about. I think that one of our dilemmas that we're facing is we're seeking out the answers as to whether we can create the change from within and how does that look, or do we have to start over? And again, Mm -hmm. I think this is a a dichotomy that's, I think many people are being faced with this sort of question, whether it be within a system or a relationship or whatever else humans have created. We were all being called to this deeper question of, can we work within what we have or do we have to create something new? I think one prescription, we often have many prescriptions as patients, but I think one prescription is to look at it differently upstream to start. So again, the self-awareness, how are we showing up? And what I want to give an example. I used to have a student um, who was addicted to heroin and her mother and I would frequently talk and she would say, I just don't know what to do to help her. I just don't know what to do anymore. And I spent more time working with the mother's reaction about how she was perceiving the situation with her daughter than trying to necessarily really even change her daughter. I found that the majority of the work was how are the people showing up amongst the problem? That's Mm -hmm. very important. And I think that again, until we realize that the system is us, the system is us. So before we make any change or shift or come up with the answers as to what's going to come first, the chicken or the egg, the new system or the fixed system, I think it's good to leave all of the doors open, all of the possibilities available. Let's not even ask that question. Nobody knows. Hmm. Let's keep all options open. Continue to do the work that we need to do to be able to show up without that judgment and a realization. I I'm at the beginning stages of this thing we call science. I'm showing up with my humility and love. When I'm judging someone else or I'm feeling these emotions, let me use that as a mirror to what I can look look at and improve on within myself. So using this system as a personal individual mirror of where we can do some better integrating. If we're going to solve or create solutions, my suggestion is that we shift our vision to go within as deeply as possible. So when we start to create answers or things start to manifest for us to move forward, that we don't yet again create another system that gets hijacked. Mm -hmm. So really understanding that what we need is a self-aware system. We need a system with consciousness. We, it grew too fast. It scaled all too fast. Things started evolving like crazy and we didn't really know how to integrate and embody the rapid change. So I think, again, more spaghetti at the wall would be, we need a self-aware system. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we can have that, as we said from the very start, is by us individually becoming self-aware with the system that we work within. And this is something that can start with us and that's something we could... It has to start with us. It has to be done simultaneously now. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to this point where we can't choose this or that black or white, man or woman, tech or conscious. We can't choose this or that. We have to, I think, do the work within what we already have and be open to see what starts to formulate while taking good right action. If your action feels like it's forced, urgent, somebody has an agenda, it's probably not the right action. So I think we just have to, like Dan said, take that one conscious breath. Let's really take that one conscious breath 
find our tribe who's willing to resonate with this material to do the self-work needed to contribute to something sustainable and see what happens from that point. But we, we can't close all hospitals while we figure, figure out if we want to reinvent the system. So we have to just understand that even though we're all burnout, guess what? The patient is very burnout too, navigating the system. Everybody's burnout. And guess what? Society's burnout. Other people and cultures are burnout. Uh, everybody's burnout. This is the time where we have to ask more of ourselves and surrender to the fact that we're in a predicament here. And it might not be the time to just completely surrender. It's got to be both. Right, at, right effort and surrender. Action and rest. We have to find a way to really navigate these. The same thing. It's sameness, but from two opposite ends of the spectrum. It's not separation. It's sameness from two different spectrums, ends of the spectrum. Well, this is where progress happens, right? Is when we're, this is where we're looking at seeming opposites and see where is the integration possible. That's where we move to the next level. So thank you. Yeah, it's not about choosing between one or the other or being right or wrong, but it is actually looking at where is the possibility to rise the water level for all boats. And part of it is, is that if this is policy driven or SOP driven or textbook driven, or <laughs> it just, that's not going to work. <laughs> so um, it's the analogy to the Ten Commandments, where the Ten Commandments only work that far <laughs> if there is a lack of the underlying understanding that if you're connected with source, if you're connected, if you're one with life, if you're one with God, whatever religion, you know, whatever the name is that the religion um, will give it, um, but that there is something that is bigger than we are. And once we are connected with that, then all the things that come across as commandments and rules are clarities, are natural. That's just, that's just what happens. <laughs> that's just your clarity. It's a description of your clarity once you see. So that is, um, that's where we want to get at, I think. So that's where you're, where you're pointing towards self-awareness, towards self-compassion, start at home. What could this look like? So is this about conversation classes in university now? This could be a very easy fix, right? So let's have some conversation classes and let's teach the students that you're, you know, before you enter the room, you know, look, you know, see that you're kind of hygienic, see that you're washed, have your fingers, you know, scrub up and, and uh, then ask a polite question in terms of how are you today, for example? Yeah? So is it is it about conversation classes? Is it about meditation classes? Is it about, what is it? What does it actually look like in everyday life when we when we pursue these principles, like what are, how could this manifest? Well, I think this is where the hierarchy within the system becomes both a detriment, but also potentially a tool. Um, I really feel that currently the where <laughs> the place we are with um, a lot of hierarchical entrenchment, um, a lot of um, roles really solidified. Um, it needs to not start, but be also including the top. And so I'm talking about seasoned clinicians. I'm talking about department chairs. <laughs> I'm talking about um, um, leaders um, at least being offered perhaps programs or help or, or, or assistance. I know this sounds a little out there, but I feel like this is such an important part that we cannot ignore um, of updates. Hey, do you see where your um, young faculty are at in terms of their spiritual development and their needs in order for you to, re to you can appeal to their outcomes, right? Um, do you want to improve retention? Do you want to improve satisfaction? Um, do you want to improve your patient outcomes? Um, do you want to address, are you seriously committed to addressing burnout? Um, then learn what or we invite you to sit at the table as we talk with them about what are their actual issues um so i think that that's a important aspect is to hit the hierarchy from the top not hit hit invite the hierarchy from the top and um and then the bottom up as well which means absolutely yeah we should talk to the um students but you know, this is ironic coming from an educator. I've spent my entire career working with students and residents and 
what I've learned and what's brought me away from them is they do not have the power and they are is quickly conditioned and entrenched into a system where there's so much rigidity, right? There's no permeability. It's all rigidity um, that the only way for them to survive is to, to do what they're um, told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder you know, how do you develop that receptivity, that openness to love at that level? It's like they're entering a system in which there are parameters. I mean, from the very inception of that process, all of us went through this rigorous standardized testing and grades and all of this stuff. And, you know, it just is challenging because what you're doing is you're almost weeding out those individuals, kind of bringing that in. So that's from a system change. That is a huge component of like, who are you inviting in so that you can allow openness and receptivity? That's a huge one. There's so many thoughts going through my head as I hear all this. And I think that just one thing I wanted to share from an indigenous wisdom perspective, from a lot of shamanic practice, it's really cool that we're coming apart or we're coming at the point of how to change the system. And what I just heard was completely resonant with a lot of indigenous wisdom of there is this idea of manifestation of seeing what the system looks like, feels like, tastes like, acts like in your heart space, and then moving back from that place into where you are. And so there's kind of this moving backwards as if this has already happened. Now you're resonating with this vibrational field of what exists. And so now you're creating something that feels new, but now you're acting as if it isn't new because it's real and now you're there. And so now you're moving kind of reverse engineering that process going from that point to where you are and moving from where you are there the whole time being present. And it might be a lot to digest to think about that, but ultimately it's this simple manifestation practice of what does it look like in a healing system that's all working, a regenerative design system. And where are we? And how do you kind of go backwards and forwards? And what really has come alive in our conversations is this idea of even in our conversations, I feel like I shifted my thought process of thinking of the system versus that we actually are the system. We in this micro macro discussion, we've talked about the microcosm. Yeah, we might be not a huge percentage of the system, but I'm taking care of patients. And I'm a physician and that's what the system is based on. And so ultimately I have plenty of time. I have plenty of connection. I have plenty of love and I am doing that. And so, yeah, the system is working. There's a part of the system that is working. People want that. They're paying for that. They're wanting it. I get it. I give it. I receive. And so we're growing together. And so as that grows and more people are experiencing or bringing their authentic being into this field of healthcare, all of a sudden, the incentives are shifting as well. Because that's, to me, that's the center point. I really feel like, you know, following the money is a way to understand what creates incentive structures, the benefits of these things. And so that's what I look at. So, but yeah. bringing it from that place of heart and just doing it and not worrying, I guess, is what I was saying, vibrating in that frequency of that feeling and then knowing that the whole thing is going to change. But it's like the idea of just working locally, like on a global issue. What can you do in your local space? What do you do with your family, in your community, in your tribe? In your... And then if everyone's doing that, that's actually a huge global movement. I, do, I just want to say quickly that I think we have to trust in the innate capability and ability in the extraordinary powers of the human spirit. I think somehow we got tripped up feeling like we can only learn through contrast, pain, and war. And I think this is something that we need to really, truly consider changing. Do we need to break people down or do we need all of this suffering to learn and grow? I'm going to vote for no and a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the current paradigm having wrong incentives, 
and we talk about what's in the way, what I note is fear. Mm. And fear to me is the antagonist, is the opposite of love. And I see the signature of fear from the point the person is crossing the threshold, the doorstep of the hospital. You, you get into a, you, you will be notified already ahead of the hospital of all the things you should be aware of and do and not do. And then you get to, you know, you, the first breath you take in a hospital, it smells of disinfectant. So it probably tells you that there's something, something yucky about me or somebody else. And it just, it just continues, right? Then there's, there's, like all the signaling, you know, there's the patient consent form that looks like basically a, a legal cover your ass strategy, right? And it has very little to do with actually actually informing, right? And this is the smallest part of the consent form. The largest part of the consent form is the fine print, right? And so it's all based on a system of suing each other. And and that's how that's the one of the first steps into a healing process, right? That we get ready for suing each other. It's like, whoa. <laughs> like there's it's just and it continues on and on and on and on, right? Where it's about the fear of making a mistake, right? Because yeah. if we make a mistake, it might cost a life, right? <laughs> so there's also good reasons for you know protecting yourself, and there's good reasons for having professional distance, and there's good reasons for we all have a great narrative around this. So we've constructed this amazing narrative of why all of this distancing and why all of this self-isolation and why all, all of this fear is justified. I think about a relationship and think about getting to the place where we can eliminate the need for a prenup. Like sure. if you don't have a prenup in a marriage, uh-huh. like if you don't, if you're going into something and it's legalities right away and, and setting you up, you smell it setting you up for a possible failure. Why, why are we, I mean, again, I understand the nature of this, but why are we setting ourselves up to, to protect ourselves from that failure? There might be something very deep in, in looking into that. When we talk about, you know, like, let's say the shamanic practices, it's obvious, right? Isn't it obvious that this is the way we can create a different environment? This is the way we can create a healing environment that is actually conducive to healing. Right? Everybody knows this. Everybody can see this. And yet, if we, if I talk to myself as a well-educated professor of medicine, right, I would my doubting mind is supposed to argue with that, right? That's that's what I'm trained to do, right? I'm not trained to feel into something and say, oh, yeah, that kind of feels right. I'm trained in a mind that knows about differentiation, right? I'm, I have a mind that learns to discern. Right. Discernment is the culture that I've been that has been really that's the muscle that's been trained. Right. So so I will react in saying like, oh, this is a nice idea, but it doesn't go anywhere. And where's the evidence? And it doesn't hold up. And like, oh, you know, you can come up. How does this hold in everyday life? Yeah. But if what if you have this situation or the other that justifies fear, right, or fear based action. Right. So it's the same mindset or I'd say personality part. (laughs) that that is then active that is then showing up so could part of the process be that we actually learn to differentiate that there there is a meaningful place for discernment there's a meaningful place for the scientific approach kind of there's a place for having your phd hat on and there is a place for having your clinician hat on right there is a place for critical appraisal and there's a place for intuition. There's a place for heart openness. There's a place for creating a vision, projecting a vision and living up to that vision, regardless of what the person up the hierarchical level letter is requiring or requesting. Not externally referenced, but internally referenced. And, and we're losing, I think, fear-based we're losing our internal reference because we're learning all the things that can go wrong, you know, and all the things we can, and and we, we're not learning that this is important to take in as knowledge. And at the same time, it is important to maintain an internal reference point rather than only relying on SOPs to the degree that once you're deviating from an algorithm, you're basically just looking at somebody suing you, right? So, so where, what would be needed or I would wish that part of the training for any healthcare professional is to rediscover 
our internal reference system, one that we all had as children, and we kind of pretend that now we know better because we're grown-ups, <laughs> but we've actually left a gem on the road, <laughs> mm. actually dismissed a competence that we had as children that we have unlearned, that we have expelled from the paradise, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. There's something that just came through <clears throat> as you're talking, Jan, is this idea of the Sabbath, of the Shabbat, of the day of rest, of allowing the feminine into the conversation. And so what you're painting the picture when you talk about fear, for me, the step beyond fear is control. And that's what's going on in the world right now. You see a lot of control mm. over what we do, how we are birthed, how we die, how we live, how we are vaccinated, how we eat, how we, that is what's going on right now. There's a control issue based on fear because that allows uh, structures to um, ultimately to control. And so it's basically a patriarchal society that we're erupting. And so this bubbling of what we're talking about is kind of allowing that feminine. And so the Shabbat or the Sabbath is this time of rest. It's like you get all your work done and you put all the work away. And it's about family, it's about connection, it's about love, it's about laughter, but it's about feeling. And so when we talk about the heart, that's what we're allowing in. And the heart is courage. It's the courage to do this. It's the breath to allow love and the openness to love and the receptivity and the surrender into this love to be a different signature, a different imprint than the fear that you're talking about. And how does a system run if that is the, the, the imprint, if, if love is really there? And I think that the fear of holding on to it is like, well, what would happen? Like, what well, we have a system in place and what, what would we do? And then all of a sudden, it's a really interesting thing when you start to experiment with this. One of the things I'm really interested in right now is like during COVID, everybody's at home. I notice there's certain diagnoses that aren't happening when I talk to my ER doc friends. There's not, we, we, did people not die of heart attack? Did people not have this? cyclic vomiting syndrome anymore like what are these things that came into the er's day after day after day and where does they go and so this is what i have in that sort of trust is like moving through into this feminine love vibration that exists already i know that we are going to be fine that we will be it's a new way but that feels very scary for some people because you're moving completely from a framework to another. So I just add that in because it's like, you know, from fear to control, moving that all the way to love. And that's where there's opportunity. If I could just say quickly, sorry, that Jan, you were talking about the differentiation that you're good at as a physician. Evolution, moving up or away from a current system or structure does invoke evoke fear in the current establishment because there's a sense of annihilation. So let's say the patriarch, let's call this the, the masculine energy of the current system that's not integrated with his beloved. There's a fear of annihilation. And really coming from this feminine perspective is she's the integration in the evolution. So to evolve and move up, we need constant Differentiation, integration, differentiation, integration, differentiation, mm -hmm. integration. Without her, that energy of true integration and love, we can never unite these two, which the true energy of the masculine and feminine is the, the coalescence of consciousness and, and energy, consciousness and wisdom with love and energy. And this is exactly what the system needs, these two forces to be working together at their optimal state. Mm -hmm. mm. So can, can I just say that um, th these are, you know, we can easily talk about feminine, masculine integration, differentiation, um, and all these different aspects, but they may be new to a lot of our listeners. Um, and so I think that takes me back to what you, we were saying earlier, what does the system look like? Well, it looks like probably we need to redefine, reclaim, re, you know, make accessible this ancient wisdom that we've been talking. We talked about shamanic practices. We talked about 
deep ancient wisdom. We talked about bodily embodied wisdom, stuff we're born with. Mm -hmm. Do we believe in that nowadays? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like figuring out how to actually talk about this is, Mm -hmm. is what a system looks like is doing some of our groundwork. um, I think to actually build fertile ground for something to grow. Takes both of them to create, right? (laughs) And then the backdrop of that ecosystem, I think people think differently. Like right now we're in such a fear of, you know, a virus, you know, or a fear of it. But like, you're like, you live in an environment with bacteria and virus and fungi and mold. And it's just a, a soup, a primordial soup of what's going on. And so, you know, to, to think through this in a different way, because I think what we come at it is still that antithesis. I mean, we talked about that early on, but that war against, and I think when you mentioned those things, when I think consciousness, wisdom, love, and energy, it's not against, it's with, mm-hmm. it's surrendering and it's with, and it's, the, I think what we've talked about, you know, what really hit me, I think was um, when we were talking about sovereignty was Stephanie, you said something and it was like, oh, it was just an aha moment again where I'm like, oh, did that vibrational feel? It's not needing to get it. It is here. So it's like what Jan, you started with, like getting out of the way. Mm-hmm. So the system has changed. The system is working. Let's work from that space. The uh-huh. system is working. What does it feel like in our being that now the system is working and how do we become open? And now how do we share and spread a message? And how do we align others with that message? And how do you become more receptive? So now it's really about creating yourself as fertile soil to enter in, to be receptive, to surrender into what already is. And now we don't have to work that hard at figuring all this out. <laughs> Great final words then. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, we need, you know, at least another 10 episodes, I think, <laughs> but we've come, I, I'm, I'm really humbled by the journey that we took together and, um, by all the learnings for me and the shared learnings, and, um, there are many ways we can take this further. Um, we already had a bit of a conversation about, you know, actually each of those episodes would merit unpacking with married meeting with colleagues sharing exploring developing and visioning together and really see what is this new evolutionary step that we can take to open up to a system that is actually working rather than to create a system or going further down a rabbit hole (laughs) that doesn't really look very productive anymore so there are different attempts now as part of heart-based medicine in the community to um, offer courses, to offer free uh, resources, to invite in the conversation. And I feel certainly our conversation is an invitation for more. I hope between us and I hope with others who may want to join the conversation. This is really the kind of conversation that at least in the 20 years that I've been around hospital canteens, I haven't really heard. And I would really love to see the moaning and the complaining and the suffering and the shared joining in all the misery that we're experiencing, kind of the shared victimhood, that we actually move to the kind of personal sovereignty that is internally referenced, where from there, we dare to share the love that we feel and we dare to care for the patient and for our people around us. And and hope <laughs> that this episode and this series has sparked a bit of the conversation, that, that we will see a bit of a ripple effect and that this will meet many other people inspiring and inviting the conversation. And so maybe gradually, gradually create waves that meet <laughs> around the globe. So thank you so much for all the insights and all your heart and all your wisdom shared and all your courage to share in public where you are with all the vulnerability and all the willingness to learn and to grow. It's, it's a deep honor to have that conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this Heart of Healthcare podcast brought to you by Heart-Based Medicine. If you enjoyed the conversation, you'll find some free resources and more information at heartbasedmedicine.org. Please share this episode if you feel inclined and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, thanks and take care.